Okay, it's 1130, so we are going to get started. After that technical overview, hopefully everybody's all set up. And I want to welcome all of you to Towards a Circular Economy for Plastics, Canadian Perspectives and Approaches. Thank you so much for signing on today. I think this is going to be a great conversation. My name is Christina Seidel. I'm your moderator for today's webinar, um, but I'm here on behalf of the National Zero Waste Council, where I am actually the co-chair of the Circular Economy Working Group. Um, I'm also the Executive Director of the Recycling Council of Alberta, so I'm happy to be here to moderate this session today. Um, I'm actually here also on behalf, thinking of the webinar, of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, who really are, this webinar series is put forward by FCM. Um, and again, of course, the National Zero Waste Council, but also Smart Prosperity Institute. So those three organizations are all collaborators for today's session. So this is the second webinar in a five-part series that um, hopefully a lot of you can sign into all of them. And uh, again, the, the, overall set, the overall series is about plastic waste management solutions for Canadian municipalities. So this webinar series is offered to you through the Green Municipal Fund of FCM, and we thank them very much for that. And on that note, then, we are going to actually turn it over to Yvonne Ritchie, who, Ritchie, who is going to give us a quick overview of the Green Municipal Fund, uh, tell us a little bit more about it. So over to you, Yvonne. Great. Thanks, Christina. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has been the national voice of municipal government since 1901. And with nearly 2,000 members, FCM represents more than 91% of Canada's population. FCM's programs are designed with and for our members. Um, and today I'll be introducing one of these programs, which is the Green Municipal Fund. In 2000, the Government of Canada endowed the Federation of Canadian Municipalities with $550 million to establish the Green Municipal Fund and an additional $125 million top-up to this endowment was added to the fund in 2017. The Green Municipal Fund is your partner in sustainability, helping you to move your projects forward by offering funding, resources and tools, training, networking opportunities, peer learning, and more. And the Green Municipal Fund offers funding for plans, studies, pilot projects, and capital projects in five different sectors, including transportation, water performance, energy performance, brownfields, and of course, waste reduction. The funding is available to all municipal governments and their partners in eligible projects. And since its inception, the Green Municipal Fund has funded more than 1,400 initiatives in over 500 communities across Canada. If you would like to know more about these initiatives, our approved projects database is a wealth of resources on our past funded projects. It includes case studies, reports, uh, contact information, and more. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at the link that we're sending now in the chat box. I would also encourage you to sign up for our weekly newsletter, FCM Connect, to get all the latest updates on what we have to offer, including webinars such as this one. Uh, I'd invite you to join us again next week on February 28th, where we'll be taking a closer look at education initiatives to encourage better recycling practices, with two presentations by the cities of Beaconsfield, Quebec, and the city of Markham, Ontario. And lastly, for any of you who are working in the energy management sector, we are hosting another webinar that might be of interest to you or your colleagues. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Natural Resources Canada are running a joint webinar on March 6th to introduce municipalities to an energy management tool called RETScreen. So we'll share a registration link for that as well. And now back to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Yvonne. So now we're just gonna move on and have a quick look at uh, who is actually attending today. We just have a map here that's going to give you some insight into who is here. Um, sorry, just give it a second to come through. So we have a, a, a real cross-section. Um, sorry, for some reason, it's just taking a second to come through. I know we have people from literally across the country, as you can see here. We have them from um, as far north as, as Yellowknife and Whitehorse. And we have, um, you know, right across the country then, you'll see from Victoria right over to St. John's. So we're really excited. We even have a few joining us from the States, which is really nice. So thank you all for coming. We also have a, a, a great diversity of people. So last week, 
on the call, we ended up with over 200 people, and we actually are anticipating at least that many today. So it's very exciting to have that much interest in, in, in this subject matter. So we're really expecting a good conversation. For those that weren't able to be with us last week, um, these, these webinars are intended to demonstrate and showcase really what we can do, ways that plastic waste is being addressed, and in particular, again, honing in on specific actions and approaches that apply to municipalities. As we saw last week, there are significant efforts globally to stem the flow of plastic le leaking out of the economy and into the environment. And here in Canada, we are seeing the same level of enthusiasm, effort, as well as action. And that's really what we're going to start focusing on today. So from the release of the G7 Oceans Charter and the CCME strategy on zero plastic waste in 2018, to the recent CCME consultations in Toronto just this week that a number of us were at, they were hosted to assist in the development of a Canada-wide action plan so that we can follow up on the CCME strategy. Businesses, governments, and Canadians are all searching for Canadian solutions to keep this highly valuable material in our economy and out of our environment. As we learned last week, shifting from a linear to circular approach means transforming really the way that we do things, changing how we make, use, and dispose of plastics to eliminate waste and really keep this material at its highest value as long as possible. This not only has the potential to reduce the amount of plastic waste that ultimately needs to be managed, also avoids harm to the environment and benefits the economy. That's such a key part because we can better capture the value of this important material. For those that were unable to be with us for the webinar last week, it featured both RAP Global and London Waste and Recycling Board, so it was a, some very qualified speakers from England, and that was a very interesting session. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, you can actually watch it because it's been recorded, and you can watch it um, as early as next week when it gets posted on the FCM YouTube channel. And for any of you that are looking for additional resources regarding this subject matter, the Smart Prosperity Institute just released, it was just this week, a paper that defines some of the key opportunities. It's called A Vision for a Circular Economy for Plastics in Canada, The Benefits of Plastics Without the Waste and How We Get It Right. And I have to tell you, I just read this Smart Prosperity paper this week when I was on my way to Toronto to the session. And it is a very good paper. I urge all of you to download it and have a look at it. It's very good. It gives us a great vision for going forward. And for more information, you can also go to the Smart Prosperity Institute uh, website. And you can also go to the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition website. There's also a policy brief on that Circular Economy Leadership Coalition that actually uh, accompanies the paper. So building on all that and building on last week's overview, today's webinar is going to shed light on what the current state of plastics is in Canada and what are the range of solutions that municipalities can use to really embrace the concept of circular economy, eliminate unnecessary waste, and again, access, access that high value that we have the opportunity to, to meet. So to help us navigate through this really important conversation, we have three great speakers today. We have Chris Lindbergh, who is head of the Circular Economy Unit of Pl at Plastics Initiative at Environment and Climate Change Canada. We have Charlotte Uetta, who is Acting Manager, Waste Management Planning, uh, Solid Waste Management Services Division, City of Toronto. And we have Annette Sinewick, who is Acting Manager of Business Operations and Change Initiatives, Solid Waste Management Service Division, also with the City of Toronto. So hi, you guys, and thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to your presentations. Are you all there? Yes, hi. We're also very excited. Excellent. And Chris, you're there? Yep, this is Chris. Great. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you for joining us. And I am going to turn it over to you momentarily, but just a couple of quick housekeeping things. So our speakers are going to talk for about half the time, and what that's going to do is that's going to leave us about 20 minutes um, for some questions. So again, send us your questions through that question tab, through the chat function, and we will get to as many of them as we can. 
And again, the session is going to be recorded. It will be available on the FCM YouTube channel within two weeks. So that's enough from me. I am going to turn it over to our experts now. So I'm going to start by turning it over to Chris Lindbergh. Again, he is head of Circular Economy Unit Plastics Initiative for, the, for Environment and Climate Change Canada. And he has a really strong history in this because prior to taking on this role, he actually led the Circular Economy Innovation Lab for the Natural Step Canada. So he definitely brings a lot of expertise. And Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you without any further delay, and I look forward to your presentation. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Just getting the technical pieces working here. So I think I've got control of the uh, screen so I can move forward. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm just going to give a very quick uh, five minute kind of scene setting around um, the, the, the state of, of plastics in Canada and globally and some of the drivers for this uh, movement towards a zero plastic waste here. So as mentioned, I'm with Environment and Climate Change Canada, and I'm with our Plastics Initiative, which is a group that supports our international and uh, domestic activities around zero plastic waste. So including working with the Canadian Council of Ministers for the Environment and engaging with industry. So to start with, um, let's just look at the, the global perspective for plastics. So we use them uh, in all economic sectors and everything from durable goods to packaging to electronics to textiles, single-use items, furniture, etc. And the use of plastics has grown faster than any other material over the last 50, 60 years uh, because it's uh, low cost, uh, it's uh, lightweight, and very durable, and very, very uh, flexible as applications. And it's also a material that its use has delivered significant economic, social, and environmental benefits from lightweighting uh, different products and vehicles and saving energy through that, through um, improving health outcomes, through the, the, the sanitary con containers for water and medication, etc. The issue is that this fantastic resource is very poorly managed globally, as well as in Canada. This graph shows the kind of ultimate fate of all the plastics ever produced, um, I think from 1950 till, till present day. And you'll see that 79% of all the plastics that have ever been produced have ended up uh, in uh, in the environment or landfill, um, and about 12% incinerated globally, um, and about 9% actually recycled in the economy. So this represents a tremendous uh, environmental challenge in terms of issues with uh, plastic pollution and marine litter, and also a tremendous loss of valuable resources and energy. So first for packaging alone, we're looking at up to $120 billion uh, a year, American dollars a year, uh, lost in, in by, by discarding these materials to landfills, etc. So in Canada, our performance is not uh, that much better than the than the global overall performance. So we have uh, a very large, significant plastics industry in Canada, about 35 billion dollars between plastic product manufacturing, and that includes products that contain plastic, not just products that are made only of plastics. Uh, as well as uh, primary resin production and recycling. And we're about 33% of all plastic that is uh, used in Canada is for packaging, but 26% for construction and 10% for automotive. And in 2016, we did some most recent data we've kind of uh, calculated through a report uh, commissioned with uh, Deloitte. Um, estimates about 91% of all the plastic um, waste generated in 2016 was sent to landfills incinerators or the environment, very small amount to the environment, less than 1%, um, and about 9% was actually recycled. So this represents about $7.8 billion in lost value, so it's an opportunity cost um, of almost $8 billion. Um, we have much higher performance for some plastics, such as plastic packaging, we're up to maybe 25% recycling, and, and quite low for, for most other sectors. And we have quite a robust recycling industry here in Canada with about 66% um, of the tonnages that we, we use in Canada can actually be processed for recycling in Canada. And we are a contributor to plastic pollution as well, about 8,000 tons in 2010, which represents about 0.1% of, of the global uh, plastic waste um, heading into to oceans and rivers and lakes. So here, let me see if I get the slide to go here. So um, in in response to this 
tremendous global interest and recognition of the need to take action on plastics, Canada leveraged our 2018 G7 presidency to introduce an ocean plastics charter, uh, which has been adopt, uh, endorsed by about 16 different governments and 20 organizations to date. And it includes a number of commitments to taking a life cycle approach to um, the plastics issue. So we looked at um, the driver being this issue around marine litter, but if we really want to get to solutions globally, we need to look at the whole life cycle of plastics. And, and that's what makes this document um, very unique. And it's the only document that and commitment that deals with all plastics of all types in all sectors. And we set some pretty ambitious goals of ensuring that from a design perspective, we get to 100% reusable, recyclable, or if no other alternatives exist, recoverable plastics by 2030, that we increase recycled content in plastics um, aggressively, and that we actually deliver in terms of um, meeting some targets for recycling plastic packaging. This is a voluntary and a global commitment, and each um, signatory is, is a, going to implement it within their own uh, means. So within Canada, the, um, just, there we go. In Canada, our approach has been to work collaboratively with the provinces and territories. And as mentioned by Christina, November 23rd, uh, through the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, we launched a Canada-wide strategy to move towards zero plastic waste. It really lays the foundation for action, identifies 10 priority result areas that capture the whole life cycle of plastics, from product design and single-use plastics to how we put in place collection systems to collect all plastics at end of life and not just packaging. Um, to strengthen the markets for um, secondary and recycled plastic materials, to building our recycling capacity to be a world leader in that space, and also activity around consumer engagement, uh, dealing with plastic from aquatic sources, uh, Im improving our research and monitoring activities, cleaning up the pollution that we have in the environment, and catalyzing action globally. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a very ambitious um, frame of action, and right now, as mentioned by Christina, we were in the process of the CCME is in the process of engaging stakeholders to develop an action plan in 2019 that really focuses on those first five result areas, um, which are really around the upstream production use of plastics. So uh, I'm going to stop there at, at the federal, uh, just with, by saying that the federal government is very excited about working with cities on this agenda and has been uh, engaged with FCM, and that we recognize that this is a very complex um, challenge and it requires a very complex systematic response. So we really, there's no one policy tool or no one actor that can shift the system. We really have to work collaboratively, different levels of government and different parts of the economy. And we're committed to doing that work. Back to you, Christina. Great, thank you so much. That was fantastic. What a great overview. And thank you so much, Chris, for setting the stage for us. Not only the stage in terms of the global perspective, which was really important, but also I think you did a very good job of defining what our challenge is. And that's going to take us now into our next speakers from the city of Toronto. So we have Charlotte and Annette. Um, Charlotte Uetta is acting manager of waste management planning at the city. And she is leading the implement implementation of the long-term waste management strategy. And obviously that's going to include issues around plastic. So Charlotte is implementing new programs that support the goals of the waste strategy and currently undertaking consultation and leading development of a single use and takeaway items reduction strategy. And Charlotte is, Charlotte is joined by her colleague, Annette. And Annette Sinewick is acting manager of business operations and change initiatives at the city. And this is a new role in the city, and she is responsible for spearheading and leading development of the division's unit for research, innovation, and the circular economy. Again, very cool for a, a municipality to be taking on circular economy like this. So Annette and Charlotte bring years of experience, and I'm not going to take any more time away from them. So over to you for your presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Christina, and thank you to FCM and everyone on the line for joining us in the call today. Uh, I just wanted to uh, get started off with setting some context in terms of the City of Toronto's uh, collection of plastics. So we provide service to almost half a million single-family homes in the city, as well as just over 400,000 multi-residential units. Um, those are on the rise and we are seeing a lot more density in the multi-residential apartment and condo sector. We also collect a lot of our waste materials from small commercial locations and from public spaces such as street side litter bins, in parks, um, and through special events that take place at the city. 
what that means is um, there's really a wide variety of sources of plastics generation that includes single-use products that can be generated on the go from uh, you know quick pickup of food um, or all the way down to uh, regular uh, consumer goods and household products to more durable types of plastics and that tend to be on the larger side including uh, plastic furniture and tables and things like that. Uh, like most municipalities, I would say, uh, in Ontario as well as Canada-wide, uh, we have, you know, a very established uh, Blue Bin Recycling Program and Green Bin Organics Program. What I wanted to highlight here today is that we actually have some additional programs that help uh, focus on the potential for waste reduction uh, in the community level. So we do that through a couple of ways. One in unique program to Toronto is our Three R's Ambassador Program, which helps provide local apartment residents support in multi-residential buildings, and it includes things like education on reduction opportunities, as well as helping residents distinguish between the different types of plastics that are emerging that they need to manage and determine whether or not they can be recycled or need to be disposed of. Other newer programs uh, also aim to uh, really leverage the community energy um, through our community agencies and not-for-profits, as well as residents to take an active role in learning ways to reduce all forms of waste, which includes potential plastic waste. And we do this through a series of repair hubs, uh, repair activities and workshops, as well as uh, having a waste reduction community grants programs that funds a number of initiatives, uh, for example, zero waste farmers markets. So if there is being food served at farmers markets, those residents that participate or might attend those farmers have the opportunity to have reusable items to help uh, consume the food that they might be uh, eating. The newer programs that I described before are stemming from the long-term waste management strategy that my colleague Charlotte uh, is helping to implement. And the full strategy is available online with a number of activities and really um, this strategy uh, has an aspirational goal of zero waste, as well as uh, uh, the goal of making Toronto one of the first municipalities in Ontario to have a circular economy. Um, together, over the 10-year period of implementation of the first part of the strategy, we hope to achieve a 70% waste diversion from landfill by 2026. Uh, this next slide goes through in a little bit more detail. I'm not sure how well it will come through on the webinar, but again, uh, all of this information is fully available on our website. But it outlines the timing and tactics uh, we intend to undertake in order to achieve the 70% waste diversion goal uh, in waste diversion from landfill. Uh, some of the key items that we're going to be speaking about today is the development of the single use and takeaway reduction strategy. Uh, and just to give some stats on the community reduce and reuse programs that were launched last year, um, just from May to December, we were able to have approximately 640 bikes repaired through the workshops, and there were over 96 events held throughout the city in neighborhood improvement areas with three, 300, over 300 different participants attending the events. We're also looking at the approach to um, recovery of more plastics through investigating the potential to introduce mixed waste processing. So what that is, is really looking at uh, the garbage stream that might have remaining resources in it, such as metals, as well as plastics, and seeing if there's a way that we can reduce the amounts being sent to landfill and recover some of those uh, more valuable resources to have them uh, reintegrated into, uh, into the full life cycle. Specifically, um, my role has been uh, over the past year building and leading uh, the, the city's new unit for research, innovation, and a circular economy. Um, and really, just going back to the core principles of the circular economy, our aim is to really limit the amounts of finite materials that we're using and really design out waste and then maximize resource potential during its full life cycle and finally contribute back towards regenerating uh, existing systems. What we've done in the first year is we've established a number of core networks and partnerships. So Toronto is one of the first uh, 
Canadian municipalities to join the Ellen MacArthur uh, CE100 network. Um, basically, uh, that partnership allows us to connect with a number of other leading global cities and actors on the circular economy stage, either through a series of government and cities calls or being able to attend acceleration events where like parties can meet and network and then find opportunities for co-initiatives or co-projects that can further a circular economy, either through finding that niche um, uh, space where there might be some alignment in, in the organization's goals, or perhaps through uh, being a, a partner that can help innovate or test some proof of concept work together. Um, we've also worked over the past year to establish a circular economy procurement framework for the city. So what that means is we'll be looking at ways that we can integrate circular economy principles more into our purchasing practices. Um, and we are looking at a number of different sectors, including textiles and food. And again, uh, that full framework and report is available on our website. Uh, in terms of proof of concept pilots, the city has uh, a program that's led through our economic development unit called the Green Market Acceleration Program. So that allows businesses in the green sector to approach the city to uh, provide proposals to see if there's a way that they can leverage city assets or resources to further green technology or, or green infrastructure within the city. So we've been able to work through uh, one project uh, specifically uh, so far to date on that through the Unit for Research Innovation Circular Economy, and that work was done on testing of compostable coffee pods at one of our anaerobic digestion facilities or our green bin processing facilities. And again, that the results of that report is on our website. We have a, a link specifically dedicated to circular economy efforts. Um, we've also recently created or established a circular economy working group that will have its first inaugural meeting in uh, March. So we have about 44 uh, participants from a variety of sectors and we look forward to working with them over the next three years and getting their core input on other city activities taking place. So how are we addressing plastic waste? I talked about some uh, high level ways, um, but just to get a little bit deeper, um, the photo that you see uh, there is basically at our drop off depots, we allow residents to uh, dispose of or provide uh, bulky plastics for drop off and recycling. Uh, historically, uh, what the city has had in place specifically related to single use plastics is we did have a very successful uh, plastic uh, bag fee that was, uh, uh, I guess, executed at a retailer level. It was a five cent bag fee. Uh, it was uh, enacted in March 2009 and it was in place for about three years. Uh, in June, Council uh, rescinded the fee, temporarily imposed a future ban on plastic bags, and then both the ban and the fee were rescinded and currently uh, that was replaced by increased efforts to reduce single-use item use, including plastic bags, as well as introducing a bylaw that requires that any single-use uh, bags uh, being provided in the City of Toronto must be compatible with the City's recycling system. So that would mean uh, if paper bags are provided uh, for distribution at a retail outlet, then they should not have any uh, ropes or grommets or things like that that may interfere with the recycling process. I, uh, as mentioned uh, by Chris, I, in, in order for plastic to continue having some kind of lifespan, it requires markets. What you're seeing here on the graph is um, basically a historical um, pricing for uh, various types of plastic. Uh, it's produced by the Continuous Improvement Fund, which is a extended producer responsibility funded or um, a producer funded organization uh, that helps municipalities with uh, recycling best practices and, and also innovation. Uh, so they produce this to help the industry or to help uh, municipalities determine what the kind of market rate seems to be for Ontario at the time. And what you can see is there are some, you know, quite a distinction between some higher value plastics 
and uh, val plastics that specifically are almost reaching uh, a zero value on the market. So after putting in the resources to recover uh, those types of lower value plastics, then we're, we're still able to kind of uh, direct them to markets. However, it's getting to be a point where we're getting into a system where we may have to pay for that plastic to uh, actually go and be recycled due to lack of market demand for end products locally. Some of the ways that we've tried to address that is uh, expanded polystyrene or uh, it tends to be one of the items that have lower dollar values. So we worked with the Continuous Improvement Fund as well as the Canadian Plastics Industry Association to see if we were able to provide this type of product in a different format, if that would change or create any more market demand if we were able to densify uh, the, the polystyrene. So basically, if you think of that, it's a very lightweight material. Even with compaction on a, a transport trailer, you'd be getting very, very low tonnage value for uh, shipping that to market. So we thought, okay, well, if we could, uh, if we could densify that, would that market potentially, uh, you know, get a little bit more success? Um, the pilot results basically determined, uh, so what we did was we, we gathered the polystyrene, we put it into a densifier, and then we converted it to the blocks that you see there. It took place over about two weeks. Uh, we did find uh, one potential buyer for the market that was a little bit uh, higher in price. However, they wanted to manage that material in an energy from waste system, and Toronto doesn't currently um, recognize energy from waste as a suitable option for, for waste. So that was not one that we chose to pursue. Um, we are looking at uh, keeping abreast of advancements in chemical recycling of plastics, where it's actually breaking down a, to the plastic at a molecular level and seeing if that could be something for, as an option in the future. And currently with this material, the Canadian Plastics Industry Association is uh, continuing to help the City of Toronto manage and find markets for this material so that it's not being landfilled. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to my colleague Charlotte, who will start uh, discussing a little bit more about the uh, provincial and policy landscape. Thank you. Sliding in here. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go toward, I guess, uh, speak towards sort of what's happening at the provincial and governmental level. So Chris certainly did speak what's happening at the federal level when it comes to um, addressing plastic waste. So for those who may not be familiar, um, you know what was happening in the province of Ontario. So uh, back in 2016, the province introduced uh, the new Waste Your Ontario Act, um, which essentially repealed the former Waste Diversion Act. And just a couple of key things to highlight from this. Um, this, uh, this act here is that you know there are uh, is language in not only just the act in itself but also the accompanying strategy for Waste Your Ontario, which is more of an action plan. Um, you know, finding words like moving towards uh, zero waste in Ontario, moving towards the development of a circular economy, as well as looking at um, the way in which you know plastic uh, packaging products are being manufactured and put into our system. So recognizing that you know of course there's challenges in finding long-term secure recycling markets. Um, that we should also be looking at the way in which these products are being manufactured. So taking into consideration things like use of uh, more recycled content in making those products, as well as making sure it's recyclable, but also looking at even reducing the amount of materials being used to manufacture that product. Um, so that's happening at the provincial level. Um, and taking that, uh, we've aligned ourselves here municipally. And we have uh, most recently adopted, or most recently, um, release a staff report on a uh, what we call the ADAPT policy. So these are essentially um, criteria and considerations that not just City of Toronto, but I would imagine you know all uh, Canadian municipalities take into consideration when they look at adding materials to their either blue bin program or to the green bin organics program. So looking at things like um, you know it, what the prevalence is of that particular material is in the waste stream. You know how much of it do we see in our uh, residential um, waste streams? Is it uh, a problematic? Is it contributing to litter? Is there a long-term viable market to actually um, process uh, that product afterwards or that plastic afterwards? As well as looking at the cost um, implications for, let's say, managing um, and processing that particular product or that plastic. So this is a 
you know, what we call the adapt policy, something that uh, you know, every time we take in consideration whether we decide to add any materials to our blueprint program, we kind of run it through these different set of criteria and determine, you know, is it um, suitable, appropriate for that then to be a part of our um, municipal recycling program. Uh, City of Toronto is also quite active in the advocacy field as well. So most recently, um, uh, along with uh, you know the uh, AMO, the uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario, uh, we have partnered with all municipalities and formed what's known as the Municipal Resource Recovery and Research Collaborative, or M3RC. And this uh, group essentially represents all municipalities in Ontario, and we are the singular voice that advocates not just to the province, but to our stakeholders as well, in advocating for a transition towards full extended producer responsibility under the new Waste Ontario Act. So these are just some avenues and channels that the City of Toronto, along with other municipalities, are voicing and sharing their um, uh, comments and thoughts on moving towards uh, EPR. So just speaking about, um, I guess, some of the broad actions that we've taken here in the City of Toronto on addressing plastic waste. Um, so the Mayor as well as Toronto City Council is quite supportive of not just the provincial but also the federal strategy of moving towards a plastics reduction future. Um, so we, had a, we have, uh, the Mayor has written a formal letter correspondence to um, the federal government uh, essentially supporting the national strategy and that we would like to see stronger um, actions being taken to again promote the reduction of plastics uh, moving towards um, you know incorporating circular economy principles into the design of plastic packaging and products and um, also looking at ways of um, you know ourselves uh, restricting or reducing the reliance of using single use and takeaway plastic products so um, one of the uh, the items that we're working on more recently is again aligning ourselves to what the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is also doing. Um, the City of Toronto is in the process of developing our own single use and takeaway um, items package reduction strategy. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about that um, and sort of the work that we have undertaken to date. So following um, City Council's direction um, back in July this uh, last year, uh, solid waste management services staff have been directed to engage residents stakeholders um, of and manufacturers of single-use plastics and takeaway packaging. Um, so these include items like the single-use plastic bag, plastic takeout containers, plastic cutlery, plastic straws, um, and among other things. So identifying these items um, for targeted reduction. So again, it's really bringing the focus up on the first R in the waste hierarchy. So rather than focusing on whether that material is recyclable, we really want to bring up the conversation and place emphasis on reduction and promoting reuse instead. Uh, so to this uh, direction, Toronto State Council has asked us to put together um, a work plan that would uh, aim to reduce the usage of this item um, in the City of Toronto. And furthermore, they've actually asked us to look specifically at plastic straws, noting that, of course, there is an accessibility component to it and that we need to be mindful of um, engaging with that stakeholder group as well. So this um, has then led to, uh, most recently, the fall of 2018, uh, we undertook phase one of consultation. In this phase, we asked two questions of the residents and stakeholders. First question is for them to provide their feedback on which single items or takeaway items they would like to see the City of Toronto address um, to promote reduction and reuse. The second question that we asked our residents and stakeholders was what would be their preferred methods so again, looking at whether they would prefer a more uh, mandated or a regulatory approach using tools such as fees, bans, um, or fines, or taking more of a voluntary approach, looking at more incentive-based programming. So the um, consultation was, uh, I would say, quite, um, it was very well attended, a lot of participants, a lot of uh, conversation, a lot of uh, engagement from the communities as well as stakeholders. Uh, we had a, uh, I would say, pretty robust consultation um, over the, uh, it was October, and we had several open houses, webinars, in-person stakeholder meetings, um, as well as we did do a polling of Toronto residents as well to get statistically um, significant um, data, and as well as uh, promoting an online survey. So for the, through all this, we received over 20,000 uh, responses through our survey. So this is, again, from Toronto residents stakeholders, businesses, community groups, agencies. So again, very well received in terms of the feedback that we heard back. And um, right now we are in the process of 
going through reviewing the comments and trying to consolidate um, almost like a, a general pulse point of what the City of Toronto residents and stakeholders feel about single-use uh, plastics and takeaway items. So the, as I mentioned, the, the consultation um, received unprecedented, unprecedented uh, participation. Um, and generally speaking, uh, we actually will be coming out with a staff report on the uh, results of phase one consultation later this year in spring of 2019. Um, but generally speaking, we did see that there is a support for um, the uh, city of Toronto to have an active role in facilitating reduction of single-use plastic items. And um, as I mentioned, so we will be coming back with the staff report in spring of 2019, uh, outlining what we heard and also outlining the next steps of consultation. So phase two consultation will be taking place later this year, um, summer of 2019, where again, we will be presenting the findings on phase one and then um, coming out with proposed policies and programs and ideas and get more feedback on how residents and stakeholders would like to see these um, programs being implemented in the city of Toronto. Um, so that uh, pretty much comes to the conclusion of, um, I guess, uh, the City of Toronto's uh, presentation, but I just wanted to put in a little um, plug in here, a little promo. Um, so for those who are in the public sector, those who might be in looking at public sector purchasing, there is um, the City of Toronto is a planning partner with the Recycling Council of Ontario, who is um, hosting or putting on the Circular Procurement Summit taking place in June, uh, between June 11th and 13th. So I just wanted to promo this and uh, share this um, event with other municipal colleagues that might be interested in learning more about um, advancing the circular economy and their public sector procurement processes. And uh, lastly, so again, um, here's our contact info. And for all the information that Annette and I both spoke about today with regards to the work that City of Toronto is taking, um, doing on circular economy, um, as well as uh, work being undertaken to promote plastic reduction, um, please visit uh, Toronto.ca slash waste strategy. And I just want to thank everyone for um, allowing us to present and to speak on some of the initiatives and look forward to the, uh, the conversation discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Annette and Charlotte. Really appreciate that uh, great oversight of what you're doing in your programs. I have to say that the, the, you're so lucky working in a unit called Research, Innovation, and Circular Economy. I mean, that's got to be like the coolest municipal position ever. So good on you. And I think it's very inspiring for other municipalities. So now we're going to um, we're going to go to questions now. So we're, we're getting a lot of questions in, and we're going to have questions for all the speakers. And we're going to get to as many as we can. I'm, I'm just going to start. I'm, I'm trying to group them together in terms of there's so many that we're trying to consolidate them. One that has been has come through in a few questions is the whole idea around performance, um, how we track performance, how we ensure that performance meets our targets, and also then referencing the idea of traceability. And I wonder, Chris, if we can come back to you first and just have you briefly speak to the issue even globally of traceability and how programs um, around the world are dealing with the issue and what you're seeing emerging in terms of issues around traceability. Yeah, excellent question. I mean, I think it's a really big challenge to get a good data. Uh, you know, right now we're trying, you know, we've spent a lot of effort trying to better quantify the use of plastics in Canada's economy and where waste is going, uh, plastic exports, et cetera. So it, it's um, it, it's really important to improve our data collection and our assessment. Um, and it, it, I, I know different companies are doing a, a lot in this space. I was talking with Danone and they have, you know, they track all their plastic recipes for all their products kind of and, and kind of categorize them every year. So I think there's great data probably at, 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 within many individual companies. At the national level, it's still a challenge because so much of our plastic is going in the into the garbage, and and it, it varies by city and it varies by by uh, by province. So um, it's a big challenge, and I don't have a, a, a simple answer on it right now. Yeah, understood. Thank you, but thank you for that perspective. And I wonder, um, Annette and Charlotte, if you can just comment on how reporting and the whole issue of data and being able to track your results reflects on you being able to achieve your outcomes at the city. 
Yeah, I said from a from a circular economy perspective, what we're looking at um, uh, through procurement is at a more preliminary stage. How many procurements can we review and uh, execute that uh, start to have more CE elements and principles integrated? So I would say that's our first kind of approach. Um, in the longer term, we'll be looking at what the results of those contracts would be. So what was the waste avoided potentially where we have some sort of baseline? In some cases, we might not. Um, uh, but definitely for things like catering, we would have known that you know there would have been some single-use items that could have been generated through execution of those contracts. Um, so that, those are some of our preliminary metrics that we're using. Yeah, and uh, so I can speak towards um, in terms of the I guess performance. So I think you know waste, unfortunately, being a tonnage-based um, system, we rely on things like waste diversion rates, and you know looking at our curbside as well as our litter audits or even audits being conducted at the mature recycling facility. So really looking at the any change in generation and the amount of plastics, also the movement of let's say plastic items from one stream to another. So ideally, we'd like to see you know more recyclable plastics ending up in the blue bin, um, and also prevalence, right? So litter audits, um, we note that plastic items such as, you know, straws and cutlery, uh, takeaway, takeout containers, they do end up um, in our public uh, space and litter bins as well. So just noting the actual pieces and counts of those types of uh, problematic materials in our litter bins and audits is also captured. So really just looking at the trend over time and uh, hoping to see a reduction um, against the baseline here. Um, some other measures that we've been able to start looking at is uh, in existing contracts, for example, in our bin contract, we did mandate the use of some recycled content. So we've been working with our bin supplier to start um, further uh, providing us with some sort of metrics to say, okay, well, given the amount of bins that could not be reused and redeployed under the current contract, what was the quantity or estimated quantity of that resin that then made its way into uh, some sort of reuse, whether it was offsetting uh, some portion of the bin resin that's being used to make new bins or whether that's going into other manufacturing. So we can start to use those metrics as success of the amount of plastic that's being captured and recirculated. Excellent. Okay, well, fair to say, based on the comments from all three of you, Obviously, tracking and data is a very important um, piece of, of the solution. Okay, we are going to move on then. I, again, these are coming in fast and furious, but one of the other things that has come up um, and a number of questions is, I, I think, um, Charlotte and Annette, you've really intrigued people with some of the things that you're doing. And so the question is being asked around um, whether you can share more information, whether there's stuff, um, even if there's easy access to some of um, your programs, your results, even even things like the results with your consultation, whether you're willing to share those. Um, because one of the comments that came up is, um, again, not reinventing the wheel, but also some municipalities are just too small to be able to undertake some of the research that you're doing. So do you want to comment on, on how that, how, how you would be willing to share some of that information? Yeah, so the um, results from the uh, consultation on the single-use plastics and takeaway items is not available anywhere at this time. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, we will be going to committee with a staff report. Um, in that staff report, there will also be, um, I guess, uh, attachment or more information on some of the feedback and results from that consultation. So I would say it's not available yet, but stay tuned. Um, it will be coming soon and happy to share that information once it becomes public. Um, however, there's also, uh, you know, in the interim, if you're interested or, you know, listeners are interested in learning about the consultation content, uh, the questions, as well as, um, you know, just more of some context, that information is still posted online. It's on our Toronto.ca slash waste strategy. And if you just follow the links there, um, there the, the public consultation content and material and uh, there was also a um, public meeting, so the recording from that public meeting is uh, available online. So um, in the interim, until that staff report is public, they can certainly visit that or visit our website and find that information online. <clears throat> yeah, excellent. another thing um, I, I would add to Charlotte's excellent answer is that um, we'd be more than happy to follow up with FCM to provide links to all of the reports that we've mentioned. 
um, so that, you know, if there's a way that that could be disseminated to all attendees, they don't have to go find it, but we could kind of summarize where we think some of those uh, key reports or results uh, could be, so we could share it that way. That's fantastic because that's that's really one of the questions I think that's being asked is whether, you know, how that can be shared and for it to go to a central site like that I think would be great. So thank you for that. I know you might be getting, I assume you guys are, are open to getting specific questions because I know there was one, for example, on the sewing hub and, you know, those specific initiatives. So I assume you'd be willing to individually talk to other municipalities that help about how these things work. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. happy to Great. share our experience. Yeah. Okay. And and building on the same topic then, Chris, maybe you could jump in with um, any other suggestions you might have for sort of centralized information that you think that municipalities that are interested in moving forward on circular economy issues might be able to use. And maybe you could even comment on some of the other, obviously Toronto is a leader, but other municipalities even globally that are leaders in this area that we might want to look at. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. I think, um, I mean, there's a lot happening in this space. It's very uh, challenging to to keep uh, on top of all of it. I mean, in terms of uh, leadership within Canada, I mean, Vancouver is another uh, large city that has taken um, a fairly comprehensive approach to looking at uh, zero waste and and the, the use of plastics. Um, and the, a number of other municipalities have looked at different pieces of it. I, I think. Um, in terms of sources of information, um, we will be releasing a report uh, we commissioned with Deloitte in the coming weeks that will kind of give that uh, national perspective on you know, the use and ultimate fate of plastics in Canada and where some of the challenges are within with, within the, the broader system. Um, and so that will be, be a bit of a, a, a resource for some folks. There's, of course, uh, lots of information available around innovation through the Al MacArthur Foundation, New Plastics Economy work that I, I know um, Toronto is part of, as well as the National Zero Waste Council. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for daily briefings and what's happening, actually, the Recycling Council of Ontario is right now doing a great, uh, great daily kind of media scan um, that includes a, a what's happening in the world of plastics right now. So. It, it it it's a challenging thing for uh, for I think municipal decision makers in particular because there's a lot of new technology out here out right now and there's a lot of buzz around its potential um, you know, chemical recycling uh, new uh, new technologies um, several coming out of Montreal and new consortia and uh, it can be very challenging to get kind of all the detailed information that one would want to make decisions um, as a municipality so. Um, I, I, I'm hopefully that will become clear as we as we start to to move forward with implementing this agenda. We'll start to get a lot more um, uh, a lot more organizations being able to report on the actions that they're doing. So, sorry, that was a bit of a long answer that didn't give a lot of specifics. Clearly, no. hitting the afternoon here. Apologies. No, no, still great perspective. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, so building more on the consultations. Um, Charlotte and Annette, uh, uh, thank you for sort of being willing to share as, as much as you can. Um, a, a couple of questions that come through on, on sort of the results within the consultations, and and one of them was around um, whether or not there were any sort of specific sector uh, pushback that you got. Like in, in doing, there always is a risk, of course, in consultation. Did you get pushback from specific groups or? Or in general, you said generally the public was positive, but what about sector resistance? Yeah, I think generally, um, I would say for stakeholders and public, uh, residential sector alike, there was a general support. And uh, so I think one of the things I neglected to mention was that the emphasis in the consultation was heavily placed on reduction and reuse. Um, I think we seem to uh, tend to gravitate towards the item and focusing on its recyclability or compostability. Um, so right from the beginning of the consultation, we were very clear that the emphasis here is to, you know, promote a, you know, a, re a reduction, a reuse behavior as well. Um, so I think that really kind of helped to set the, the tone of the conversation. And I would say that, you know, certainly there was some um, some comments, some challenges on, you know, the, uh, I guess the items being targeted. But I think that's not, you know, to say um, it, it wasn't unexpected, right? So I would say, yes, there was 
some reluctance, but also general acceptance that yes, it is about reduction and reuse first and foremost. It's not about you know whether we should make this product more recyclable or should we you know look to um, add more items to the blueprint program. So I think that has certainly helped um, discussion to be I guess productive um, and really kind of keeping it a targeted uh, consultation question. Right. Um, and one of the questions I actually, was, sir, oh, go ahead, please. I mean, I think uh, um, one really important uh, framing that we found kind of that is, we've been following with the provinces and with the stakeholders we've been engaging is that, you know, our, this vision we've adopted of, of zero plastic waste is about keeping plastics in the economy uh, and, and out of the landfills and environment. And it's really about tackling that waste perspective. And so there, there are a lot of different policy tools one can use for that. And it's really important to, you know, as Charlotte was saying, to, to use that waste management hierarchy to think about um, the higher value activities from reduction and repair and reuse through to, to recycling. Um, but also to just to think about how as policymakers we can, can approach this in a way that we don't get unintended consequences. I think um, there can be challenges with when we look to, to ban a particular product or restrict its use um, based on one aspect of performance that uh, can then generate unintended consequences in terms of increasing use of, of perhaps less desirable products as well. So I right. think it's it's a it's um it's a really complex issue and it's a big challenge. I think recognizing that our focus is on reducing waste um, and keeping the, capturing the value of these materials can help take the conversation in the right direction. Excellent. Thank you. So, so kind of building on that then, specifically with the ICI sector, how is Toronto planning to engage the business community? Obviously, they're a key player in this in, in moving forward on, on your initiatives. Sorry, so the question was on how do we engage, are you engage, engage, them? engage the businesses? Yeah, absolutely. They are certainly a, um, I would say, key player, key stakeholder in this conversation that we're having. Um, and they were, you know, part of the conversation in phase one. They will continue to be so in phase two, recognizing that, um, you know, they do have a part to play in the um, in the initiation or the implementation of any sort of uh, programs and policies. Uh, we generally connected with the, um, I would say, the associations, the largest, like, you know, Retail Council of Canada, for example, um, and you know more so representatives of the uh, the retailers or grocers and like the the commercial establishments. So more so connected with the large associations, um, and then for them to, you know, represent their their um, their stakeholders. And like I said, yeah. So it doesn't mean that we are certainly um, keeping them uh, as a part of a conversation included in consultation. And and they were active participants. Or I should say that they were certainly um, present. And uh, in, in phase one consultation, I anticipate it will be the same for phase two. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, can can we? This is probably getting close to to the end of the questions, but but can I just get all of you to comment on the role of public education in 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 this whole circular economy um, push? Yeah, I I, I guess I'll, I'll start off. Um, I think. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to see a renewed and invigorated focus on on waste in general. I think we've been uh, uh, always working towards uh, bringing it to people's awareness through our own promotion and education campaigns, but the issue of plastics has really become that gateway conversation. And so, uh, you know, for us, uh, we definitely, you know, go back to the waste hierarchy where we want to make sure that waste is designed out of the system so that it doesn't need to be managed, whether that's through, you know, refusing uh, any products and kind of being prepared on the go. Uh, and we we try to incorporate that into all of our education, as well as making sure that there's a good balance between that higher level hierarchy, but also how to use the actual existing program. So as a municipality, we can't ignore that these these items still come into our system and we need to manage them the best way we can in the most uh, best way that, you know, gen makes sure that we're optimizing recovery as, and reducing contamination. So we're always trying to to play that little bit of a balance. So we want to make sure that we're getting that circular approach to how we're communicating as well. 
Excellent. Thank you. No, that's fantastic. I love the concept of plastics with all this attention potentially being a gateway drug to to, to get more public attention on, on, on the waste reduction file. Do you want to maybe just give like a 30-second um, answer to that, Chris, and then we're going to wrap up? Yeah, I think uh, public uh, engagement and education uh, is absolutely essential to being able to be successful with this agenda. I think it's, it's, I would extend that beyond just public to, to businesses and, and retailers to really make them aware of the options they have and the considerations need to, to take. There's a bit of a chicken and egg thing in particular right now, you know, the message is loud and clear that the waste system and recycling system is very uh, confusing because it's so different everywhere you go, um, right. even within the GTA. Uh, so we need to do our, our work, I think, as at, at different levels of government to kind of harmonize and align those systems so that the public can then do their part with the real clarity and consistency. Excellent, thank you. So. All the speakers, Chris and Nat Charlotte, on behalf of FCM, National Zero Waste Council, Smart Prosperity Institute, thank you so much for sharing these very valuable insights with all of us. This has been incredibly helpful, incredibly um, interesting, and I want to ask all the participants to please consider going online and looking at some of the resources that we had mentioned. So you can find most of those as mentioned. And uh, thank you also for attending because it really is the participation that makes these things so valuable. And remember, the recording is going to be available within two weeks. So you'll see this uh, feedback slide up there. There is a participant form that you are going to be getting. Please fill it out. We'd love to hear from you so we can try to improve these webinars as much as possible. And thank you all very much for your time. And we all look forward to the next one. Thank you.